Uh, welcome to Free Speech Unmuted, a Hoover Institution podcast on free speech. I'm Eugene Volok. I'm a law professor at UCLA Law School and about to become a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. And I'm Jane Bambauer, uh, Brechter Eminent Scholar and Professor of Law at the University of Florida. And Eugene, I see you were wearing a t-shirt today. That's right. It's my robot law t-shirt. Well, how appropriate. Yeah, that's where, you know, in order to learn the three laws of robotics, robots have to go to law school. Uh, so, so the, and they, they, first year is the first law of robotics, second year, the second, third year, the third, except robots are smarter than us. So they, so they figure it out more quickly. Yeah. So m maybe we can shave it down to a few semesters. Well, but, but the first rule, you know, do no harm. Wait, what is the first rule again? Do, don't harm a human or something. So uh, how's yes. it doing on that score now that we, now that our robot overlords actually exist? Yeah, well, I'm thinking that so far, descriptively, uh, AI hasn't done much harm, but it's early days yet. Um, and I think a good bet is that any tool that humans create will always be used for harmful purposes. Uh, partly, I suppose, uh, uh, because of the intentions of the humans, partly because of accidents, uh, but it's, um, uh, it's uh, pretty inevitable. Uh, and uh, uh, right now, of course, uh, uh, AI mostly, what it does is it mostly speaks, mostly communicates, mostly outputs images, mostly outputs text. Uh, already, people are plugging it into other processes. Uh, so, so, of course, the harms once uh, AI can, for example, operate a self-driving car, let's say, uh, just to pick a purely hypothetical science fiction scenario... <laughs> Uh, the, those those are going to be governed by various other areas of the law. But this is a podcast on free speech. So our question is, what do we do when AI causes harm by speaking? Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What's the problem? Uh, that's what we're going to deal with. And the first question that I think uh, we need to ask is, does the free speech clause apply at all to the output of AI? Now, if, even if it doesn't, there's still the question of what kinds of restrictions we might want to place on the output of AI. Maybe we could say, you know, there's no constitutional protection for AI output, but it's still a bad idea to, to overregulate it. Uh, but um, if there is constitutional pr uh, protection on AI output, then at least the purely speaking AIs are going to be free. What does it mean for an AI to be free? So um, uh, so that's, that's, in a sense, the first question that we need to deal with. Uh, Jane, what do you think about that? Yeah, well, you know, I, I find it kind of interesting that uh, outside of free speech circles, at least, uh, when, when I raise this issue, uh, people tend to think that the First Amendment either obviously applies or obviously doesn't apply. So maybe maybe that shows uh, that there's actually an interesting coverage question or a potentially interesting coverage question, although I think you and I largely agree on, on how it should come out here. But but the argument that uh, that maybe the First Amendment shouldn't apply is that free speech is all about speakers and uh, the AI being computers that more or less autonomously are, are generating um, output that, that we might call speech uh, still wouldn't be protected the way human speakers would be. I think that's more or less um, uh, the argument that, that maybe it shouldn't apply. Uh, I, I don't buy that for a number of reasons. First of all, just purely descriptively, the Supreme Court uh, in numerous precedents has found that there are First Amendment interests that adhere not only based on speakers, but uh, based on listener interests as well, or the, you know, the, the right to sort of receive uh, uh, ideas and, and freedom of thought. Um, and so, so one way of looking at this is that the output, that, that AI-generated output needs to be protected because uh, it is communicative to people who are receiving it. Another way of looking at that that I prefer and that Justice Kagan has written about back when she was a law professor uh, is to look at what the government's actually doing and why. And so if the nature of the harm that the government is trying to reduce is a speech harm, meaning the, the problem is that 
an AI bot, say, might produce some speech that then that then causes the speaker to either uh, suffer emotional distress or go do something unwise, or in any case, uh, you know, that causes a harm that has to flow through some sort of communicative process, then I'd say, okay, the First Amendment is present here. And so we should go ahead and, and do an analysis. How do you think about these things? Uh, well, uh, oddly enough, I agree with you entirely. Uh, so I, I do think it's an interesting question. If you think of free speech as primarily about self-expression, whether there is self-expression going on there, there might be not the expression of the AI, at least unless we do conclude at some point an AI is self-aware enough to be a person, but let's bracket that for now. Um, uh, there may be a self-expression of the AI company. Uh, that may have designed the AI uh, uh, program or have trained the AI program uh, to uh, to output certain kinds of content. In fact, a lot of uh, recent controversies have been uh, have stemmed from evidence that AI companies are biasing outputs in various ways and producing things that fit a particular ideological agenda. Well, that may be bad customer relations, uh, uh, but it may suggest that it that they are protected by the First Amendment. Uh, but even setting that aside, I totally agree that uh, there the are rights of listeners involved here. Um, uh, so just to give an example, imagine the government says, you know, oh, oh, we're just really worried about communist propaganda. It's coming back. Uh, so we're going to ban AIs from in America from outputting communist propaganda, because after all, they have no rights. So who cares? Well, that would interfere with the rights of of users if they want to see communist propaganda, uh, to or, or if they want to perhaps produce communist propaganda of their own. And I mentioned communist propaganda because there's actually a case on the rights of listeners in communist propaganda. Lamont v. Postmaster General. It's a 1965 case. As it happens, it's the first time the Supreme Court ever struck down a federal statute on First Amendment grounds. It took until 1965 to do that. Uh, and that uh, statute uh, uh, provided that uh, 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 communist propaganda sent from foreign countries, generally speaking, in part from foreign governments, um, uh, uh, could not be delivered to Americans unless the American recipient specifically says, I'd like to see it. And of course, a lot of people in the 50s and 60s wouldn't want to be on the list of people who said, I'd like to see communist propaganda. Now, the Supreme Court didn't say, well, foreign senders and much less foreign governments have First Amendment rights. It reserved that question. That question is still not fully resolved. Uh, but it said- Hello, TikTok fan. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, uh, but, uh, but it did uh, uh, say that this interferes with the rights of Americans as recipients, as listeners or readers. Uh, and I think the same thing uh, would apply here. Uh, what's more, AI is a tool for creating speech, kind of like a camera. And just like many courts have said that bans on photographing or video recording things in public places are unconstitutional, especially when people, for example, are, are recording uh, police officers uh, uh, and the like. Um, uh, uh, so I think uh, restricting uh, AIs um, uh, uh, as creators, as, as things that people can use to create their own speech would uh, would implicate and usually violate the First Amendment. And I just want to yes. close by by highlighting that I also entirely agree with you and with Justice Kagan in this, uh, in this respect, that uh, if the government is actually deliberately trying to block certain kinds of speech precisely because of its content, that itself is a uh, is strong evidence that there's a First Amendment uh, uh, violation here, whether we're thinking of the rights of speakers or the rights of listeners. So if the government says we just AI can't output racist speech or anti-government speech or pro or anti-Israel speech or whatever else, that certainly sounds like a government attempt to suppress a particular viewpoint in the marketplace of ideas. Yeah. Okay. So two two quick reactions. One one is that you're you're right that things like cameras have been recognized as protected because they're sort of critical tools for creating speech. But I, I've been surprised. I mean, <laughs> despite the fact that I've been you know writing about it for over a decade now, I'm still surprised at how um, kind of uneven the protection of things like the right to record uh, still is. Uh, and so. I think that's one reason that um, there may be 
some wiggle room in in the AI context to, if if not entirely sort of, uh, you know, come, come out with a totally different analysis from what we're su suggesting, maybe at least um, uh, find some alternative route uh, given given this uh, new uh, technology. I hope not, but I just, you know, it it it's surprising that a lot of times, even when the courts are protecting, say, video recording in public, they make their rules somewhat narrow. They talk about how it's important to anticipate a, a, a broad audience. They sometimes em emphasize the 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 fact that uh, the the tool is being used to produce political speech as opposed to just any other type of information. But the, but but another backdrop to all of this, I think, is the evolution on commercial speech, where there too, the Supreme Court in recognizing that things like advertising are constitutionally protected, they did so because of listener interests, not solely because uh, the corporation has an interest as an autonomous speaker. So so I think there's a lot there in terms of listener rights. Okay, but here's, uh, this will help us get to the second topic I know we want to talk about. One, one kind of um, practical argument that maybe AI should be treated differently goes as follows. Well, it's true that listeners, uh, you know, especially open-minded listeners deserve to have access to all manner of, of ideas and information. But um, in fact, we have kind of implicitly relied on the idea that humans won't um, necessarily uh, produce bad information at the same rate that some maybe a maybe a, a machine might. So although it's true that people defame each other, maybe they do so in 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 ways that are more predictable or less often or something like that than a machine would. And so having a kind of human requirement, maybe doing something very pragmatic, um, if we and if we abandon the the idea that there needs to be a human speaker, perhaps uh, that puts strain on the listener interest. So, um, so what do you make of that? Or maybe more specifically, you know, what what, what do you think courts are going to do when ChatGPT and and uh, Google's Bard, it's not called Bard anymore. What's it called again? Gemini. Gemini, I think. Gemini uh, uh, starts producing libelous or, you know, otherwise illegal information at a, at great rates. So that's a great question. Um, uh, there already are two cases uh, on uh, um, uh, AI and libel, what I call large libel models cases uh, that, uh, that are being litigated in U.S. courts, at least two. Uh, one is in the federal district court in Maryland and another in state trial court in Georgia. The one in Georgia, actually, the judge denied OpenAI's motion to dismiss. That, that, that was an OpenAI uh, case. Um, and uh, uh, it doesn't mean that the plaintiff has won yet by any by any means, but but, but the here judge we go. It's think, being litigated. Right. Yeah. It's being litigated. Yeah. The judge seemed to think that there's at least some plausible legal basis for this kind of claim. So one thing to keep in mind is if AI is protected by, even if AI output is protected by the First Amendment, it's probably protected no more than human output. And there are limits on the First Amendment. Libel law is one of those limits, right? So if we say that AI output is protected, well, we really mean it's presumptively protected. And there are some exceptions. And one of the exceptions is for defamation. Uh, so, so uh, uh, as we know, of course, social media platforms and some other online companies do get extra protection, not because of the First Amendment, but because of uh, Section 230, um, the uh, part of the old Communications Decency Act. Uh, and that provides that uh, uh, online speakers essentially are not responsible, uh, I oversimplify here, but basically are not responsible legally for um, uh, speech posted by other people. So, so you can't sue, or you can't successfully sue Facebook uh, for libelous material or other harmful material that's posted by a Facebook user. Even though Facebook provides the hosting, even though Facebook might amplify that, you can't, generally speaking, sue. But that protection, I think, is not going to apply to uh, generative AI companies, precisely because their programs are generative. Um, uh, when somebody is suing OpenAI for, for libel, that person is suing because of libel that's output by OpenAI's programs themselves. So the claim in that case, Walters v. OpenAI, is OpenAI just made up 
this stuff itself using its algorithm for which for which OpenAI is is, um, uh, is responsible. Uh, that was uh, using uh, OpenAI's ChatGPT product. Um, uh, and uh, 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 in that situation, Section 230 doesn't apply because OpenAI is being sued for its own output, the output of its own programs, and not material supplied by a third party. So then the question is, how do you apply libel law rules uh, to um, uh, AI output? So for example, as we may know, um, uh, one really important element of uh, uh, libel law rules under the First Amendment is so-called actual malice requirement. Um, of course, actual malice doesn't actually mean malice. This is the lawyer's <laughs> habit of uh, using English words to mean something completely different, at least sometimes. Um, uh, so actual malice means knowing or reckless falsehood. So even a, uh, a, a public official or public figure can recover in a libel case if he shows that the defendant knew the statements were false or knew they were likely false and didn't investigate further. What does it mean to ask whether a computer program knows that a statement is false? Now, in some situations, if it's a private figure suing, then at least, and again, I oversimplify here, but at least in, uh, in, uh, in some situations, that private figure uh, can prevail in a showing of negligence. Well, what does it mean to say a program is negligent? It didn't act reasonably. Well, what's the standard? Didn't act like a reasonable computer program? Well, it turns out, I think, that these standards, even though at first we might think are very strange when applied to, to AI programs, actually are applicable. So one question might be, Did was OpenAI alerted that uh, its program was outputting certain kinds of uh, uh, libelous material? Specifically, not just in general, but specifically was outputting uh, libelous statements. In the Walters case, it's that uh, uh, that a request to analyze the complaint in some case just made up allegations of embezzlement against the plaintiff, that the complaint in that case had nothing whatsoever about. Um, uh, so if OpenAI had been warned about this and didn't implement some sort of blocking mechanism to, to block the continued output of that, which is in fact part of the allegations in the other, in the Federal District Court Maryland case, uh, then I do think it sounds like knowing or reckless falsehood. Knowledge not on the part of the program, but on the part of the company, of the employees of the company. They were alerted that this output was uh, was being produced and they didn't do anything about it. Likewise, negligence, it would be careless design on the part of OpenAI. So if, for example, uh, there are particular design decisions that foreseeably uh, would lead to a good deal of libel and that could easily have avoided it, then there could be liability and that kind of analogous to negligent product design, but adapted to the libel context. So I do think that these libel lawsuits might prevail. Now, but there's another question that you asked is, should we say that given the possible scale of the libel here, uh, that, uh, uh, that there should be more demanding standards imposed in OpenAI? Maybe, I hesitate to say no, 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 never. Uh, but I'm not sure the case has been has been proven so far. Among other things, uh, um, uh, much AI libel is in response to queries, generally speaking. So in both of these cases, the claim was when somebody does a search or, or uh, uh, not a search, excuse me, gives a uh, provides a query in Ch to Chat GPT or does a search in Bing, they get this kind of material. Well, that could be quite damaging to people, but it's usually outputting one, one at a time, one, uh, one libelous statement at a time, and not always even completely predictably so. Sometimes it might output something else because there's random variation uh, in AI output. Whereas, for example, if the New York Times is output something, that's outputting simultaneously to hundreds of thousands or millions of people. So, on balance, it may not it may not be the case that AI is more damaging by way of libeling people. Maybe it's just differently damaging or similarly yet differently. Yeah, I, I, I think I agree with that. In fact, I, I, and I actually, I'm actually maybe more worried about the impact of liability than you are. Not with, not, you know, notwithstanding my, my comment that it might be, it might happen at a greater scale or in a different way, as you put it, um, than ever before. I worry though that be, precisely because there's one concentrated choke point it may be irresistible for lawmakers to start 
uh, imposing, you know, very high expectations of, of, um, of, uh, you know, accuracy or, or error avoidance, um, in a way that is not actually very reasonable. Um, I, I mean, even the example of, uh, a direct alert that, that chat GPT has, has said something wrong about a specific person or in a specific way, I'm not sure we want a legal system that incentivizes the company to set up either bespoke guardrails where this sort of system could be exploited so that people can clean up a record, you know, falsely clean up their own record, um, nor would we want it to overreact so that other searches that would, or other queries that would normally get pretty good information are kind of damaged. And, and so I hope if we do go down this route toward assessing software or, or you know, AI models under something like a product's liability rule, I hope we take really seriously the kind of constraints that the courts have created over time within that domain where the plaintiff needs to show there really was a design that not only reduces the harm that the plaintiff is complaining about, but also doesn't exacerbate other problems, right? So I think that's absolutely right. Let's just step back a bit and look back 60 years ago now to New York Times v. Sullivan, long before AI, but it dealt with some pretty similar issues, right? So the claim in New York Times v. Sullivan was, look, libel law has too much of a chilling effect. Libel law is supposed to, I oversimplify here, but basically supposed to only punish false statements that damage people's reputation. But it also may deter people from saying true things because they're not sure whether it's true or false, or they do think it's true. Maybe they're confident it's true, but they're worried that a judge or a jury uh, or in criminal libel cases, a prosecutor is going to conclude uh, uh, that they're actually false. Uh, so those are very serious risks. And uh, um, six justices in New York Times v. Sullivan said, well, because of that, we're going to set up for libel lawsuits by public officials this so-called actual malice, again, the knowing or reckless falsehood standards that will diminish the chilling effect while still preserving libel law. Now, three justices concurred in the judgment, agreed that the libel the decision needed to be vacated in that particular case. But they would have gone much further. They would have said that uh, for lawsuits brought at least by public officials and matters of public concern, there should be categorical prohibition uh, on such libel lawsuits. Mm -hmm. uh, because even the actual malice, knowing a reckless falsehood uh, standard uh, would still have too much of a chill. Even at the time, there was an interest among some of the 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 justices to create an immunity that would have looked kind of like Section two hundred and thirty within First Amendment law for certain right. contexts. Yeah, right. So that that's right. And you know maybe they were right, but the bottom line right. is they didn't prevail. Yeah. That uh, you could completely eliminate the chilling effect uh, of libel law on true valuable speech by completely eliminating libel law, or you could do a lot to protect reputation by returning libel law to a much more pro plaintiff standard but then you'd then you'd have uh, uh, then you'd have a lot more of a chilling effect on true speech and on opinion and the like so the law has come up to this sort of compromise solution and i'm inclined to say it'll probably follow that but you may be right that it may be that people may be too worried about ai and or maybe rightly worried a lot about ai might shift things to a more pro plaintiff perspective or might be worried about the chilling effect and shift right. to pro defendant perspective now uh, jane i want to ask you about something that i know you've been thinking a lot and writing about what about other harms not just to reputation but to life and limb what about uh, AI outputting um, information that's mistaken in a way that could cause people to accidentally injure themselves, maybe eat the wrong kind of mushroom? Uh -huh. Well, I, yeah, so so there has already there has, in fact, been uh, a case where uh, AI generated content has suggested that a mushroom is non-toxic when it actually uh, is harmful to digest. And uh, Eugene, I think you and I are tickled by this because the facts match a famous uh, case, uh, Winters versus, I'm forgetting the defendant's names. You remember the publisher name? I think Putnam. Um, Putnam, um, where a, a mushroom encyclopedia uh, wrongly listed a mushroom as non-toxic when in fact it was toxic and, and a reader of the encyclopedia was harmed and sued the publishing company. And the court's uh, basically said that uh, under First Amendment principles, if not 
strictly speaking, First Amendment law, um, the the normal route to negligence liability or product liability just don't apply to publishers. Um, and uh, the re the rationale, I, I mean, I, I think it's time to think through uh, the reasoning of that case and, and whether uh, even if it made sense at the time, it, it, it still makes sense to, today. But I, I think what was happening was that even though we could imagine um, a, a range of cases where we would allow someone to sue somebody else for saying something that was wrong and that that totally foreseeably led them to injure themselves. Um, we wouldn't want to impose that kind of risk on uh, publishers, maybe not even on authors, because there's just too much uh, potential liability um, out there uh, on those terms. And, and so th this was, a, I, I, you know, w Winters makes me think that actually it's possible that if we had, if we didn't have Section 230 and we had to think about what to do with the problem of um, large internet companies or large tech technology companies that produce lots and lots of information all at once, um, it may be that a compromise position is just too hard to work out and that it's something that's much closer to an immunity may be the the more uh, rational response. Um, on the other hand, I, I I think much 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 like your analysis of libel, I think it's also possible that what we'll see is that uh, AI companies will be treated uh, with some liability risk for negligently say, saying, you know, suggesting, uh, giving some advice. Uh, that leads, again, foreseeably for some people to either harm themselves or harm third parties. Um, and that would fit pretty nicely under sort of well-established expectations of of duty, uh, meaning when, when courts even putting aside the First Amendment, when they have to decide, you know, who is going to be held responsible for harming other people, uh, they'll, they'll sort of, you know, they won't be willing to, to trace too far back uh, up the the chain of kind of causation but but they will ask um they will ask okay well when you took some action even if it was verbal even if it was speech um could you have known that someone who was paying attention and maybe in in context where you really knew that they were likely to to act on on this uh piece of information would hurt themselves um and i can imagine a rule um over time getting crafted for, for AI companies, even though courts have not wanted to impose such a rule on publishers or, you know, rap, rap music producers who might inspire uh, copycat crimes or any other number of, of uh, speakers and publishers um, whose, whose speech may have in fact um, inspired uh, some, some, some harm. So, yeah, I, I think a lot of, there's a lot of possibilities out there. We don't know quite how courts will jump on this. I do want to highlight one, one important possible distinctions here. Uh, so um, uh, when we started talking about libel, we were talking about false statements of fact. And the Supreme Court has said false statements of fact generally lack constitutional value. Sometimes they need to be protected to avoid a chilling effect. But still, on balance, uh, they they can be restricted in various ways, and I think the same thing is true if uh, uh, if uh, AI uh, program outputs something saying this mushroom is safe to eat, or to make it even more factual, the uh, uh, all the medical authorities say this mushroom is safe to eat, <laughs> even though all of them say the exact opposite. Um, now, there's a different kind of a possible uh, route to, re, uh, to a possible harm, which is expression of opinions. Oh, you ought to be doing certain things. Oh, you know, go ahead and use cocaine. We know that it's dangerous, but it's so much fun. Uh, or, uh, or possibly, again, as you point out, copycat crimes, like something um, uh, 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 that... Uh, it's a movie that's produced by AI, uh, glamorizes certain kind of behavior in the minds of a small fraction of uh, the viewers, and as a result, they go out there and commit crimes. There, it seems to me, the First Amendment uh, uh, argument for protection is a lot stronger. Uh, mm -hmm. There, we're talking more about uh, the territory of the incitement exception, which is deliberately very narrow, or it has said that advocacy of illegal conduct 
can be punished, but only if it's intended to and likely to promote imminent illegal conduct. And other than that, the possibility that something may inadvertently or in some long-term scenario um, uh, cause uh, uh, some people to act badly, not because of the falsehood, but because it suggests that some behavior is good or glamorous or pleasant or whatever else, um, that, uh, that is something that's uh, 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 presumptively unconstitutional, at least when, when uh, 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 ordinary humans do it, and I think will probably apply as well to AI. So those are the two most important and most high-profile topics, maybe not most important, most high-profile ones. There are three others we just wanted to flag briefly, maybe for a future episode. So one has to do with this question, what about uh, um, uh, the power that AI companies have to mold public opinion? Imagine that people st start using, as we're already seeing them do, start using uh, AI um, uh, uh, programs in order to answer various questions instead of search engines. And they end up trusting the, the, the output of those uh, programs. And then they end up maybe voting based on the output of those programs or deciding deciding uh, on various kind of political topics more broadly based on the output of those programs. And imagine there are only two or three of them out there. Should we be worried about it? Now, it used to be that uh, this was a big concern back when there were these three major broadcasting networks that had tremendous uh, tremendous influence potentially. There were various regulatory schemes that were aimed at keeping uh, um, uh, keeping individual companies from getting too much influence. They were in many ways, I think, misguided, uh, in some ways perhaps counterproductive. Uh, in general, they, they, there's always only so much they could do, in part because for uh, for business reasons, often there was only one newspaper, for example, in any one particular town. So at least on local issues, there was really only one voice. Uh, but there were attempts to try to prevent that, to try to maintain second newspapers and and, the, and limit the, the amount of influence any particular company could have. So I think one interesting question is, will and should Congress be concerned about that if it does look like people are uh, getting all their information from, let's say, Google or from Microsoft slash OpenAI, uh, is that bad for democracy in certain ways? And what, if anything, Congress can do about that? So that's one issue. A second issue uh, is uh, um, uh, the copyright lawsuits against AI. and wanted to ask you what you thought about that. And a third issue is, should we be worried about AI getting too good at manipulating us, too good at kind of emotionally moving us in particular di dimensions? Obviously, good writers and good filmmakers have always been uh, have good at manipulating us. That's what <laughs> yeah, them that's writers right. and filmmakers. <laughs> that's how we tell whether a filmmaker is good uh, uh, is by whether he or she can manipulate us effectively. Uh, but should something be done about that? So I just wanted to ask you to close by speaking to those two, two questions, the copyright question and the manipulation question. Yeah, so I, I think both of them probably deserve more time for in a, in future episodes. So hopefully we'll get to it. Uh, the copyright question is is uh, hard because I I think there is some threat to the uh, incentive to be creative in the first place. If uh, if you know that anything that you create can be copied by someone saying, "Hey, Chat GPT, write me an article in the style of Eugene Volokh on X topic or something like that." Um, However, I'm I'm less sympathetic to the copyright claims related to having uh, copyrighted material used in the training data set uh, in in the first place. So I, you know, maybe some in the future we can sort of parse through whether there's some some good claims and some bad ones, and what copyright law will have to do, if anything, to to navigate this. Uh, on the you know AI manipulation, I do you know it. For the most part, I'm skeptical for the reasons that you suggest that, you know, good good writing has always been somewhat manipulative or a good idea also, you know, sort of often operates both on an emotional and an intellectual level. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when I think about why drugs, especially recreational drugs, uh, are allowed to be regulated, it's only partly because they are ingested and have some like direct physiological or uh, phys uh, physiognomic um, interaction with our bodies. It's also partly because, you know, our, our minds are in some sense taken over. And so, so if there's some slippage between 
AI and something, some effect that 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 is that uh, prof, you know strong. Um, maybe it will become an interesting question. I'm not sure we're there yet, but in any case, we'll have to save a lot of this for a future discussion, especially because I think I disagree with you on the um, the political uh, the the you know whether there's going to be too much power concentrated in these companies. So so let's uh, let's definitely talk again. So these are great questions, and uh, uh, they uh, give me an opportunity to provide an epigraph for the end of this episode. Can epigraphs go at the end? Well, why not? So this is uh, from Rudyard Kipling in a speech he gave in 1923. He says, I am by calling a dealer in words, and words are, of course, the most powerful drug used by mankind. Perfect. Well, Maybe by AI kind, they'll be even more powerful. And what should we say about that? In any case, great pleasure as always talking to you about these fascinating questions, Jay. Yep. And we'll see you all in the next episode. <laughs>